I'm in everyone welcome again. My name is Lance. This is The Gathering. I'm so glad that you're with us today. This is uh, an opportunity for us to get together, to have a cup of coffee, to sing a little bit, to pray a little bit, uh, to hear a good word spoken, uh, and communion. And uh, I'm so thankful that you're with us today. And uh, if you haven't been with us before, the way The Gathering rolls is through uh, what we call series. And series are, are, are set times and topics where we'll take a few weeks and we'll focus on something that we think is really important and needs to be talked about. And uh, we'll take certain themes, sometimes the book of the Bible, like Revelation we did earlier this year, spent seven weeks walking through the book of Revelation. Sometimes it's important, you know, uh, points of contact between faith and the real world. So, for example, uh, we did a series on faith and science. Sometimes it's just important things the church needs to speak into. Uh, we did a series on sex, death, and money here at the start of the fall. Uh, anytime you want to catch up on any of these messages or share them with a friend, you can always find them on our podcast. Uh, this series that we're in right now is rooted in a bit of history. You may not be aware of it, but October 31st, 1517 is an incredibly important day in the life of the Christian community, particularly the portion of the Christian community that we call Protestants, of which United Methodists are a portion. Uh, this is an incredibly important date. If you notice the nice round number, uh, October 31st, 2017 will be the 500th anniversary of this moment. And I'm a history nerd. I really love history. I particularly love the Christian history. I think so much of our, uh, who we are today and who we will be tomorrow is made clear and more understandable by understanding where we've come from. And so I love the Christian history. I love ex examining it and understanding uh, how it's influenced us today. So we're focusing over the course of this month uh, on this date and what came to follow after it, which means a great deal of focus on a man named Martin Luther. We'll be talking a little bit more about Martin Luther over the course of not only this sermon, but the rest of the series, helping understand how what he started came to influence your life and faith today. And so we have a communications department. And so I was talking to the communications guy on the phone, another guy my age, uh, early 30s, and, um, and I was talking about what I wanted to call the series, and I, I really wanted to call the idea radical faith, right? Uh, there's a lot of different reasons I love the idea of radical faith, but he's a child of the 90s, so when he heard the word radical, this is the only image that he could come up with. Martin Luther skateboarding was his suggestion <laughs> to radical faith. And I was like, I enjoy edginess in all of its forms, but I think that misses the point. Uh, so thank you for that suggestion. That's going on the all-time rejection pile for sermon series graphics. Uh, so we're focusing on uh, something called radical faith. Uh, I know, boring. That's the best I could come up with. So we're focus <laughs> I like the other one I heard <laughs> from the back. Radical faith uh, is what we're focusing on. And... Uh, we're focusing on uh, particularly the, um, the insights gained, the lessons shared, uh, the influence on creation gained by this one man, Martin Luther. And uh, again, I shared in week one, which was two weeks ago, one of the things that's really frustrating when you're trying to talk about Martin Luther, and we have a picture of Martin Luther, is, you know, Martin Luther was uh, a radical. Martin Luther was a rebel, right? Martin Luther was dangerous. Martin Luther was intimidating. Uh, Martin Luther didn't back down, right? Martin Luther uh, was a really intense guy, and, and I talk about all this, and then I just show you this derpy oil painting, and so I have to come up with better photos, and so I'm like, this is what Martin Luther really needs. You need to, when, I, when you think of Martin Luther, I want you to think about this, right? <laughs> That's Martin Luther. If you don't know who that is, ask your parents. Uh, <laughs> So Martin Luther is an intense guy. I even like, he's got like this Christological symbol like going on in his hand. Um, it was actually, I, had, I was going to show Paul Newman and Cool Hand Luke, and then I showed uh, Linda McDermott, one of our uh, pastors, and she was like, no, this is the photo you need. So per Linda McDermott, that's what I need you to think of when you think of Martin Luther. And so Martin Luther's history, and it's, get that out of the way, it's too distracting. Um, I'm not going to sit there and look at James Dean while I'm preaching. Um, so I need you to understand a little bit of how Martin Luther was shaped and formed to understand what Martin Luther came to do. So Martin Luther grew up in the late 1400s, early 1500s in what we now call Germany. And he's a good uh, Christian boy, right, and Christian youth. And uh, particularly, he is consumed by the number one way in which faith is talked ab about to him in his context, right? And as he understood it, particularly as a youth, the whole issue between God, Jesus, Christ, humanity, your sins, your life, your faith, everything that he consumed all boiled down to the one central question, and that is, if you died tonight, what would happen to you tomorrow? Right? Everything boiled down to that. His entire understanding of the Christian life, the Christian faith, uh, the response to Jesus Christ in the world, as it had been explained to him, what he consumed was just what happens to my eternal soul after I die. Right? He is consumed by this question. Right? That is what's driving him. That's what's leading all of his responses. In his early 20s, 
he's still so shaken, so consumed by this question, even though he's going through the motions. At one night, he's in the middle of a thunderstorm, and he prays, God, if I survive, uh, I will give my life over and enter a monastery. Lightning strikes, and he says, there it is. So he gives up. He becomes a monk, right? He enters, uh, he enters a, a faith community. They call them religious. He becomes a religious, meaning he becomes a monk, uh, primarily thinking, like, if I do that, I'll surely make it, Right? I mean, come on, like I'm trying to do my best out here in the world. If I become a monk, surely then I'm in, right? So Martin Luther enters the life of a religious, becomes a novitiate, and he's going through the motions. You know, they have their, 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 they're going through the Benedictine hours. He's praying. He learns the Psalter by heart. He's doing all this kind of praying. And one of the things that he has come to absorb through the church, one of the church's teachings uh, that he has taught at this time, this is not a biblical teaching, this is not a Jesus teaching, this is a church teaching of his time, that the only way a sin can be forgiven is if it's confessed. Right? That's what's taught in his community. And so he participates in a sacrament called penance, which is a sacrament in their community, not in ours. And uh, penance is basically bringing to a priest or a confessor uh, acknowledgement of your sins in the past, right? So that they might be forgiven, so that you might go to heaven, right? And he's consumed by this process. He's obsessed with tallying even the smallest and most venial sins so that they might be forgiven, right? Martin Luther is one of those guys who, when he walks into the booth, just outrolls, you know, the huge sheet, like down the street. And the, 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 the confessor's thinking like, man, you were here like 12 hours ago. How much trouble can you get into in a monastery, <laughs> right? Like, there ain't nothing here, dude. And in fact, he was one of the people who would leave the confessor's booth, get out the door, and go, oh, I forgot that one, right? And he's describing his life, and he is just absolutely wrapped around the axle of this concept of sin and forgiveness, to the point where even the other monks and leaders are like, dude, chill, Right? And so, in fact, he has a spiritual director, which is something every one of us should have. Someone who's, he's having a one-on-one relationship uh, who's leading him through uh, what it is to grow in faith. And this spiritual director uh, recommends something to him. It's called mysticism, right? Mysticism, the mystics. They they recommend that he do a lot of reading and reflecting on the life of the Christian mystics who have come before him, right? And so he's reading through all of the writings and the reflections of these amazing holy people who lived with this deep relationship with God, right? They weren't so consumed in the sin and law paradox. Instead, they just had this deep loving connection and relationship with God. And the young Martin Luther is reading these texts, and what he's realizing is that he is unable to love God. He realizes he, the young man who's in the monastery, he, the young man who is praying, who is singing, he, the young man who is going to confession over and over and over again, is categorically unable to love God because he sees God as this arbitrary scorekeeper of rules and sins and forgiveness and in and out. And what he realizes is he's not lo- he does not love God. He hates God. He hates a God who would make him this way right? He hates a God who would set him up for failure this way. He comes to the realization that he actually hates God. Um, in his early 20s, right? We're all just a big barrel of fun in our early 20s. <laughs> and uh, he comes to this realization, right? And he's not just, he's not overreacting, but he's like, this is really hard for me, right? I'm really struggling. And so, uh, he, he again, under the direction of his spiritual directors, he gets an amazing spiritual director, an amazing leader of his community who actually says to him, most people in this, communi- in this situation would say, like, if you're having a crisis of faith like this, we need to, like, put you in a hole and keep you away from the impressionable ones, right? Instead, what he gets is a leader who says, you know what, you're exactly the kind of person who needs to be reading and teaching the Bible, right? A person who's wrestling so deeply a person who is so consumed with the desire to live in a close relationship with God, you are exactly the kind of person that we need reading and teaching others. So Martin Luther uh, goes on um, to read and teach, and it's there in Wittenberg um, in 1517 where he nails to the door on October 31st um, of the university chapel door in Wittenberg, Germany, 95 theses on the efficacy and power on the sale of indulgences. That's the actual document that gets nailed to the door, right? 95, it's usually called Luther's 95 Theses. 95 Theses on the efficacy and power of the sale of indulgences. So for those of you, and I promise the history lesson's coming to an end, what had happened in that period of time 
that started out kind of incrementally and very quickly was taken advantage of was the process of selling of indulgences, right? This is literally something the church is up to in their context to raise money, right? They're raising funds. Uh, it's happening locally in Germany. It's happening in the papacy and the Vatican to help rebuild uh, St. Peter's Bas Basilica and complete its construction. Uh, initially, um, the sale of indulgences was kind of tied to their understanding of things like penance, uh, and, and, f and financial participation and prayers of um, intercession, what it really became once it had reached down to the local level, once it had been taken on by a bunch of uh, not-so-scrupulous leaders, how it was being preached in the actual congregations, in the chapels, uh, in the streets and in the fields of where Martin Luther lived, uh, the idea of an indulgence was if you purchase an indulgence, right, which is a, it's giving money to the church and receiving a piece of paper in exchange. If you purchase an indulgence, what you get is that someone who has passed away or you yourself will receive forgiveness of sins and entrance into heaven, right? That's how it's being communicated and taught, right? That's not how it originally came up with, but that's the reality of what they're teaching in that context, right? There are all these different sayings that we have records of from the sermons that are being preached on behalf of the sale of indulgences, and they're saying things like the, the sheet of paper of indulgence has as much power as the cross of Christ, right? They're preaching things like that. They're saying, if you who purchase an indulgence, your soul becomes cleaner than on the day of your baptism, right? This is the kind of language that's coming into play with the sale of indulgences, Martin Luther nails to the Wittenberg door 95 theses on the efficacy and power of the sale of indulgences, uh, an academic argument basically saying this is heresy, this is anti-God, this is anti-gospel because this is not how salvation works. Salvation does not work through purchases. Salvation does not work through acquisitions. Salvation does not work through earning. Salvation does not work through this slavish commitment to this act of penance. That is not fundamentally where salvation comes through. Salvation comes through faith in Christ alone. So put your pieces of paper away. Right? I'm calling Martin Luther a radical. A radical, because what he is teaching is vastly different from what everybody else is doing. We call Martin Luther a radical because what he's doing gets him into trouble, and we're calling him a radical because he is not inventing anything. What Martin Luther is doing is leading the church back to its roots. Anybody ever been a part of an organization that starts out as one thing, and then five years later turns out into something else? And then five years later is something else. And then 1,500 years later is something else. <laughs> right? There's this, uh, there's this apocryphal story that I've heard. It came from my family, but I don't think that's true. And that's a story of uh, a, a person who learns how to make um, Thanksgiving ham from an, from an elderly relative, uh, from their parents. And then the, one of the key things you have to do in making the Thanksgiving ham is you have to cut both ends of the ham off of it. Right? So when you're baking a Thanksgiving ham, you do all the braising, you do all whatever, and then you cut both ends of the ham off, throw those away, and then cook the Thanksgiving ham. That's how they learned from their mom. And then uh, their mom was asking, and they taught them, that's how I learned from my mom. Right? You've got to cut both ends of the Thanksgiving. And these, these hams are just wonderful. They're just great. Right? And one of the key steps everyone who learns is you've got to cut both ends of the ham. Right? And at one point, the person who was sharing the story was actually having dinner with their grandma, right? the person that anyone knows as, the, as far back as this recipe goes. And she asked, Grandma, why do you have to cut the ends off the ham? And she says, well, it was 1942 and my oven was too small. <laughs> <laughs> right? That is a preacher's story. Mercy. <laughs> right? Sometimes you're just part of something that goes on and goes on and loses its way and loses its way. And before long, we have no idea what we're actually doing, right? One of the things that has dramatically changed your relationship with Christ, the church of which you are a part, and what it means to live faithfully as a follower of Jesus is what Martin Luther returns us to in his writings, his teaching, and his insistence that salvation does not come through faithful church membership. Salvation does not come through you doing this, that, and the other and earning your way in. Salvation comes alone through faith in Jesus Christ, your hope and your Savior. I want to back this up with a little bit of Bible, right? I mean, it seems only natural. Turn with me, if you would, to uh, the chapter um, 1 of Romans. Romans is uh, a New Testament text. Um, 
It's uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans. It's on page 858, if you have one of those red Bibles from the back. Uh, Paul is writing to the church in Rome, right? Paul, the, the disciple, is writing to um, a church in Rome. And one of the things that he's helping the church in Rome understand is the idea that there's no difference between Christians who used to be Jewish and Christians who were never Jewish in the first place, right? All of these identity markers are not what makes you in. It's not the source of your salvation. It's not where everything comes from. What makes you in is the work that God has done through Jesus the Christ and the little earworm that gets stuck in Martin Luther's head and changes his life forever is Romans 1:17. Let's get there. That's why I'm ready to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome, Paul writes. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is God's own power for salvation to all who have faith in God, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, meaning people who were Jewish and people who were never Jewish. Salvation is for all of them through faith. God's righteousness is being revealed in the gospel from faithfulness for faith. As it is written, the righteous person will live by faith. God speaks to us through the reading of scripture. Thanks be to God. The righteous person is the person who lives in right relationship with God. The righteous person is a person who has received God's salvation. The righteous person is the person who has figured out what it means to be one with God through Christ, and they will live by faith. Let's skip ahead. It's later on in that same section, Romans chapter 5. He's expounding throughout the entirety of Romans on this relationship of salvation through faith. He expands it here, Romans 5, 1 through 5. This is a great thing to mark or underline if you've got your own Bible. Hey, it's a great thing to mark or underline if you've got any Bible. Give the Gideons a gift. Therefore, since we have been made righteous through his faithfulness, meaning through Jesus' faithfulness. Jesus' faithfulness to God's plan is one of the ways in which we receive right relationship with God. Therefore, since we have been made righteous through his faithfulness, combined with our faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand through him and we boast in the hope of God's glory. But not only that, we even take pride in our problems. Because we know that trouble produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. The hope doesn't put us to shame, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. This turns, gives us the language that is key to what it is to be this portion of the body of Christ, United Methodist, salvation through... Salvation by, theology is always in the prepositions. Salvation by grace through faith. Salvation by God's grace through our faith. One of the things that this early church community, right, here in the 60s, here only 30 years after the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the early Christian church is falling into the trap, is being split apart by the people who want to say that salvation is through faith and Christ plus something else, right? People are saying, Christian leaders are teaching, salvation is by faith in Christ plus something else. In this context, they're saying salvation is through faith in Christ plus becoming Jewish, being circumcised, keeping the kosher laws, uh, limiting yourself to context with non-Jews. This community is saying salvation is through faith in Christ plus something else. Paul says no. No. That is misunderstanding the entire thing that, is, that what God is up to. Salvation is by God's grace through faith. That's it. There is no Plus. Romans isn't the only letter that expands on this. In fact, Romans is kind of hard to read. Let's turn to Galatians. We're doing a Bible study on Romans right now. My Wednesday night Bible study, 6 to 7 o'clock. Uh, we're, we're going through Romans, and uh, about every 15 minutes I have to go. It gets better, y'all. Um, <laughs> Romans is hard. Romans is legal language. Uh, Galatians 3, 23 through 29. This is the same kind of thing, right? He's writing to another community who's being beset by Christian teachers who are saying salvation is faith plus something else, right? And Paul is saying, no. Before faith came, we were guarded under the law, locked up until faith that was coming would be revealed, so that the law became our custodian until Christ, that we might be made righteous, meaning saved, meaning made in right relationship with God by faith. But now that faith has come, 
We are no longer under a custodian. You are all God's children through faith in Christ Jesus. All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. Now, if you are Christ, then indeed you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. God's promise to save the world. That is what makes you in. It is faith. The community that Martin Luther was growing up in had fallen guilty to that old trap of saying that salvation is faith plus right relationship with the church, sacraments of penance, etc., 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 right? They were saying salvation is through faith plus. Martin Luther brings us back to the root. Salvation is by grace through faith. And this is hard to understand, right? Salvation is by grace through faith. In fact, Methodism as a whole, Methodism is very like, mm, mm, mm. spreadsheets, rules, orders, right? That's how we, we attract people who like that kind of stuff. There are other Christian communities that are way more like, I've never been to a Methodist worship service that was like beating a drum around a tree. Like, that's not how we roll. Um, straight lines, right? That's our jam. <laughs> Guilty. Uh, we, uh, we attract doers, right? We attract achievers. We attract people who cross off the list, right? People who get things done. And it can be so hard for us sometimes, even in our Methodist community, to accept it is just faith, right? It is just faith. And the hardest way um, I see people struggle with this, it, it kind of needs a story, right? And so help me. This is, this is the best metaphor I can come up with. Um, this service is free and you get what you pay for, so. <laughs> this is the best metaphor I can come up with. I grew up, uh, my parents had a boat. They've always had a boat my entire life. And uh, my parents grew up water skiing. And so my brother and I learned to water ski at a young age, right? We were little water skiers. I've since had to retire. My back does not like water skiing anymore. Um, but I grew up water skiing all the time, elementary school, junior high, high school. And uh, my parents were always really good about letting us take friends out on boat trips with us too, right? And so you would take friends and then None of my friends growing up were actually from Texas, bless their hearts. They were all, they were all from the non-boating parts of the world. And uh, so none of them ever knew how to ski, right? And over the years, my dad has just turned into like the ski whisperer, right? <laughs> it's like scan, stand and deliver with water skiing. He's like this expert water ski teacher, right? So I have watched him teach dozens of people how to water ski. I've got the whole spiel down. Um, I'm not allowed to drive the boat yet. Maybe in my 40s, that'll be something I'm grown up enough for. <laughs> Maybe I'll get there, but not yet. But I've heard all this feel, right? And so when you see people water ski, he gives the directions, right? And, you know, butt down, tips up, butts down to the, you know, locks arms, lean back, etc. cetera. And, uh, and some people just get it, right? They, just, they pop right up. Some people are the doers, right? They can't just sit back and let the boat do the work, right? You know, you're just bobbing in the water on your skis, and then the second that the boat starts taking off, these are the people who start to pull on the rope, right? These are people who start to yank on the rope, who try to fight their way up, right? When we just got going, they're the ones who try to stand way before you're able to stand, right? And what happens when you do that, for those of you who are water skiers, is you start to like squirrel around. When you pull on the rope, you actually start going faster than the boat is, which means you start sinking in the water because there's no tension. And then the boat catches up on the rope and it just slacks you and it either rips it out of your hand or you get the like in the nose tunnel thing through the water, <laughs> right? Though That's what happens. And so, of course, you can kind of tell in advance, who, and you can't explain to someone what's going to happen until they experience it, right? You just have to just let them experience it. And so my dad circles back around, does the pass, and he gives the same talk he's given a hundred times, right? You need to keep laying back, right? Tips up, butts near the heels. You need to lean back. Do not pull the boat. Let the boat pull you, right? Do not pull the boat. Let the boat pull you. Let the boat pull you, right? Anybody on their own, no matter how strong, no matter how athletic, no matter how gifted they are, bobbing in a life jacket with two water skis can get up on top of the water by themselves. It has nothing to do with how good you are. It has nothing to do with how strong you are, how athletic you are. You cannot do it. That is not how it works, right? The, and if you try to do it, how you are going to end up is underwater, yanked, bathing suit, 20 yards behind you. 
right? That's what's going to happen. We went through, the, my generation went through the, ba- the baggy bathing suit area, and it was era, and it was hilarious. If you try to do the pulling, if you try to do the work, if you try to do the earning, you will end up face planted and dragging. And if you lean back and accept what the boat is doing to and through you in just a half a second, you will be flying. Do you get where I'm going here? So what does this actually mean? Salvation by grace through faith right? Faith, at its core, is not just answering yes to the hypothetical. Faith is so much more than someone asking you a question, Jesus is the Son of God, yes or no, right? Faith is so much more than a yes to that question. Faith, every single one of you has faith. Do you realize that? No matter who you are, no matter where you came from, no matter how you found this place this morning, each and every one of you walked through this door with faith in something, Each one of you thinks the root of my life, the foundation, the thing that I can count on to be there for me is X. Some of you walk through this door and your faith was in Christ. That is the thing that will be there for me no matter what. Some of you walk through the door with faith in your good looks. It's always been there. It will be there, right? Some of you walk through the door with faith in your ability to earn. Right? Some of you walk through the door with faith in your spouse. Right? No matter what, that is the thing that will always be there. Every single one of you walked through the door with faith in something. What Paul is urging you to, what Martin Luther is calling you return to, what I am saying to you is make your faith in Christ Jesus. Let that be the root of who you understand yourself to be. Let that be the the solid rock on which the foundation of your entire life is built. Let that be what your faith is in and your access to that, your ability to do that, your ability to actually build a life as an educated person in 2017 in this collection of stories and communities that has been handed down to you for generation. The power, the ability to actually do that is not something that you are doing. It is something that God is doing in you. That work, that power, that presence, that promise, that assurance, that is God's grace. God's grace is not a character of God. God's grace is an action of God. God's grace has been working on you since the moment of your first cries. God's grace has been working on you and all the lives and all the people that brought you to this chair this morning. God's grace has been fixing you, calling on you, reaching out to you every single day of your life. And the moment that you say, yes, I am broken. I am incomplete. I am not yet as I will be. I have regrets and faults like everybody else, but I believe that you love me, trust me, and want me. And I am in the moment that you put your faith made possible in the power of that You receive God's salvation, and God's salvation is way more than a ticket for later. God's salvation is way more than a better room in a better neighborhood, right? God's salvation is the offer to fly. God's salvation is the offer to live a life that's actually worth living, God's salvation is an open invitation to actually, for the first time in your life, experience what it's really meant to be human and to recognize how good that is. Salvation is an offer to you. Salvation is a promise to you through God's grace that you can say yes or no to. Martin Luther reminds us, we do not earn that salvation. We do not achieve that salvation. We do not acquire that salvation for ourselves. God is offering it to you and saying, put down all the other stuff that you have filled your life with that is leading you to selfishness, death, destruction, depression, anxiety, fear, and hopelessness. Lay that down. Be forgiven. Be remade and build your life on this. Say yes to that. Let us pray. Great and loving God, our radical brother, dangerous, a rebel 
an outlaw, accomplished all of this through standing firmly on your words and your promises, that your salvation, your life worth living, your ticket into eternal prosperity with you forever is not faith and, not faith and, but just through faith, through building our lives, O God, on what you offer us and what you promise us and what you make real for us through the life, the death, and the resurrection of your Son, Jesus the Christ. O God, those of us who have taken that step before, let us say yes again, and those of us who stand on the precipice, may may we say yes for the first time ever. Let this story be our story. Let your promise be our reality. And in all this, may we follow in the life and the example of your will made perfect through your Son, Jesus the Christ, in whose name we pray the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.